Round three, and welcome to another exciting episode of First Thursdays. If you don't know who I am, my name is Jay Sparks, and we're here to discuss you and the questions that you've been posting in our Discord. And Kurt and I thought it'd be a great opportunity to revisit those questions and do our best to answer them. Now, if we don't get to your question, please don't be afraid to ask it again in the Discord and we'll try to hit it on the next episode. With that being said, let's dive in. Epic A4 intro, take one more. <clears throat> Before we dive into the questions, a quick message from Kurt. Hi everyone, welcome to the first Thursday edition for October 2024. Before we get started with answering a lot of the questions that have come in from investors in the company, I wanted to just remind everybody of something that I do talk about uh, when we're having these types of discussions. And that is, is that we are a public company. And as a public company, there are disclosure issues that are obviously very, very important and we have to adhere by those. And so I'm not able to really disclose things that are not public information. Now this video will be publicly posted so that anything that I say about the answers to these questions doesn't fall under what's known as selective disclosure, which is me saying something to one of you on a phone call and not letting everybody else know about it. So we don't have to worry about that. But I will say that some of the answers to some of the questions that you have, I'll try to make them as fulsome and comprehensive as I possibly can, but please appreciate that we do operate as a public company and therefore uh, I can't really talk about specific of things that might be speculative in nature. So with that, back to you, Jace, and let's have the first question. Thanks, Kurt. Question number one. There's been a real emphasis the last few quarters on attempting to improve the share price, including cutting spending to become cost neutral and hopefully slightly positive EBITDA. I know other strategic considerations have been alluded to as a means of boosting the share price as well. Unfortunately, these measures have been unsuccessful thus far, and there's been no sustained positive movement on the stock price, only continued lows. So these questions come from the viewpoint. A. Is there a price point where we could expect to see insiders buying stock on the open market? It seems this could boost confidence and spur the stock price higher. Is there a price point where Q best ROI is to buy back stock instead of spending on growth? And B, can you address the ideas such as selling off a high cost cash flow negative arms of the business? Are these still on the table as a means of improving SVF profitability? Wow, that's a long question. <laughs> Okay, let me start uh, at the beginning. As I've said many times before, no one is more unhappy with the share price of QU Media than management, uh, board, and other large investors into the company. It's a subject that we talk about all the time. It's something that causes a great deal of consternation and dismay. And, you know, I've, I've often talked about how the company has continued to grow, the company has continued to build revenue, the company has continued to drop its burn rate. And while all of that's been happening, the share price has continued to drop. So why is that? Look, it's not an excuse, and maybe it's an explanation, but the way the way we see it is, is that first and foremost, we can't do anything about the nature of the micro and small cap market everywhere in North America, but in Canada in particular, and also in the US. And as I've said before in previous uh, videos that we've posted and in previous presentations, you know, misery loves company, and the only solace that we gain in any of this, which is not much, by the way, but the only solace we get is by knowing that we're we're not the only company that suffered through this. And, and, and it's much easier, and I, I once put up a chart on a previous shareholder call where I actually showed how much various companies have dropped over the last uh, three years. And it's, it's, it's pretty astonishing. And so we've suffered from that. Uh, the other thing that's happened is that media companies in general have really struggled. If you look at companies like uh, Warner Brothers Discovery or Viacom, these are major multi-multi-billion dollar corporations that have also not been darlings of the stock market. So the area, even though we don't really consider ourselves and certainly don't consider ourselves a comp in any direct way to a Viacom or a Disney or a Warner Brothers Discovery, the fact of the matter is, is that we are are in the media space and so there's a lot of downdraft that's coming from that arena which isn't helpful and so when you combine all of these things together it's been a struggle 
It's been really, really challenging and difficult. So where does that all lead us to? Well, the question, the first part of the question, if I can remember it, I believe, was about buybacks coming from the shareholders. Well, the other thing that everybody has to realize and understand is that, first of all, our chairman, Scott Patterson, always participates in every round of financing we do. Well, what about me? What about Jace? What about the other people that are in this company? We've been here, Jace and I as an example, and I'll just use us specifically, we've been in this company for 10 years, as I've said before for on previous calls. We've never sold a share. We've gotten what I would consider over 10 years of service to this company, extraordinarily modest increases in our salary and, 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 and no bonuses for that matter in terms of what, what we've gotten. And so, and we also sit on a lot of shares and we sit on a lot of shares that we haven't sold. I mean, for me personally, and, and this is, you know, sort of public information, if I have, let's call it 10 million shares in this company, if I start selling a hundred thousand shares a month it would take me eight years to dispose of the shares that I have and I haven't sold a share yet and I'm not intending on selling a share so the reality is is that people like Jason myself and management sit on a huge amount of uh, on shareholdings that we can't do anything with and that have not provided any value to us or any gain that we've gotten out of the company to this point and so there's a bit of a myth I think that exists that somehow we're all sitting here rolling in cash and receiving cash bonuses and getting share comp and getting this and getting that. And trust me, it's a myth. And uh, you can also check any of the disclosure things. You'll find out that no one, not myself, not Scott Patterson, not our CFO, Kevin Williams, not any of our board members have sold any shares. And so we see ourselves as holding for a long period and we've been holding for a long period. In addition to that, we've lost option grants that we've worked hard for. We've worked for, we've received option grants that are at higher price that were always intended to be things that we were going to make money out of, not lose money out of. And as those have vested and expired after a five-year term, they've disappeared. And so I'm not asking any investor in this company, nor would I even remotely uh, suggest to any investor in this company that you should be crying for the problems that we have. We might be personally very unhappy about the situation and certainly not what we plan for as a business, but there's no impact in terms of the share price that's greater than that and there's no sort of free cash that's constantly floating around from the management or other people in this company that have come from us that we're anxiously looking to do share buybacks that's part one part two is this Share buybacks, and I'm not going to start citing companies because it's kind of probably inappropriate for me to talk about companies that have done that in the small and micro cap space. I guarantee you with 9 out of 10, if not 99 out of 100 cases, it's gone nowhere. And so what the companies have done is they've used cash, which is in shortage, short supply for most of us, they've used cash to do a share buyback that might have caused a little minimal 10 or 15% spike for a day or two, and then it goes back to where it was. Why is that problematic? Well, then everybody, including ourselves, are always dealing with capital constraints and having the prospects of looking to raise more capital. Well, why would we want to use capital, then have to do some sort of dilutive financing to bring more capital into the company when we've spent that on shares? So in short, we're not Google, we're not Microsoft, we're not Apple, we're not sitting on billions and billions and billions of dollars of cash that's free cash that we don't know what to do with it. So we're going to buy back some of our shares. In those instances, that makes complete total sense. Why would they not do that if they believe in the growth of the company? So the way we look at our support of the company is by being fiscally conservative in terms of the pay scale that we all operate on as, ma as management and board. Board doesn't get any cash, it's paid only in shares. And we look at it in terms of not selling our shares in the open market because we expect the value to be much higher. And so I think it's important for me to talk as much as I can about part two of the question, which really it was about, I think, selling off other assets of the business or doing other things to try to improve profitability and results, financial results of the overall business. The answer to that falls a bit into the area that I was talking about at the very, very beginning of this video, which is there's only so much that I can talk about. And the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, I, I guess I should know by now that everything takes longer than I want it to or expect it to. With that said, we are unpacking, evaluating, and looking at 
every aspect of our business. And we have a short list, but a very important list of things that we expect to achieve between now and the end of 2024, and in a worst case scenario, into the very, very early parts of 2025. A lot of that will become more visible and apparent as we move forward over the ensuing three month period. Frankly, when we started doing these videos, I'll say that I probably hope that by this first Thursday of October, I was going to be able to talk about a couple of these things. We're still a little bit behind schedule and not able to, but suffice it to say that there's a very, very strong belief by all management, by the board, and I'm sure supported by investors, that um, the idea of continuing to spend huge amounts of money and having to do dilutive financings in the public market before we can turn the business into a cash flow positive business and gain some real value out of the assets that we've built, particularly, particularly those that are profitable, is a big point of, of focus for us right now as a business. And so we're working on that around the clock. We expect that you'll be hearing things from us, certainly between now and the end of the year, and hopefully sooner than later. And maybe if we get lucky, when we do the video for the first Thursday of not November, I'll be able to give a little more specific insight into some of these things. Question number two. Raj mentioned on the last call, the Q broadcast channel GRP was up five points recently. Is the upward trend continuing? Why are we not hearing more about this part of the business? And what is happening to the broadcast and channel business overall? Part two of this question is, Related to this question and based on what was just said, I think we know the answer. Is there any plan to start a TV channel in Tamil language to cover the state of Tamil Nadu? There are many famous influencers available with millions of followers. You can partner with them and create some unique programs. So the channel business, as many of you that are longtime investors know, was really the driver for the uptick in our valuation and our share price and everything else. Now we know that also coincided with a white hot market and we've been facing exactly the opposite of that, of that over the last three years. But we always looked at the broadcast channel and the broadcast business as the Trojan horse, if you will, and as the way that we were going to enter India to be able to get visibility for our brand and visibility for what we were doing without spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to create a brand from scratch and we still feel really really strongly that we not only accomplish that but that we accomplish that in a very very positive way with that said the broadcast business is also a very challenging business in India just like it is in other parts of the world I spoke a minute ago about the problems that are faced by companies like you know Warner Brothers Discovery Disney Viacom etc uh, in the media space right now and much of that is really starting to travel slowly but surely into the India landscape as well so what's happened is is that our channel, which was very unique and very individualistic when we launched it, has now been followed, frankly, by a lot of competitors. And while competition, you know, what is it? Uh, uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. That's great, but what's happened is a lot of the other free-to-air channels that exist in the India space have started to do some copycat programming and other things. And what's happened is in FreeDish, which is our most important distribution platform, it's created a bit of a log jam in terms of the, the channel lineup that sits there. Now we're still very, very strong in terms of, of what's happening with our channel. Almost every week, week in and week out, we have third highest audience of any free to uh, air channel in India. There's one called Dongle, another one called Manoranjan, and we generally are always in third place in terms of the size of our viewership audience of 80 or 90 million people every week. Where we fall off, which drags down our GRP a bit, is in what's called TSV, or time spent viewing, which is where we're at the lower end of that because we tend to feature snack-based content and have a maybe ADD <laughs> afflicted audience of younger people that spend, you know, channel flick more and, and, and our programming by its very nature is not really long form movies, it's more snack-based content. And so as a result of those two things, we found ourselves in the middle of a pack and a very strong pack of channels in the free to air space, but we've really struggled with how much money are we going to invest into this to keep growing it? What are we going to do? As some of you know, and reflecting on the question that was submitted about Tamil language, we launched a Marathi broadcast channel. And we stuck with that Marathi broadcast channel for almost a year, but it was burning cash. It was expensive to run it. We, were, we needed to put more money into it. And that sort of coincided with the drop in the market, the drop in our share price, the challenges that existed in terms of raising more capital, et cetera. And we ultimately moved that over to just be a connected TV channel. And for the moment, it's sort of in 
mothballs. Why is that? Because we didn't see that there was a upside potential for all shareholders and for valuation of our business in general that we could get from a Marathi channel that was going to take continued investment and burn that we didn't really have the cash for. So where we've ended up with the broadcast business and the connected TV channels is a very, very strong push and move to take the burn rate of those channels down. That may reduce ultimately the top line revenue growth, but it'll take the fact that we're needing cash to continue to grow those at the present time. And we'll sort of see what happens with those channels in the meantime as we move them forward and, and continue to build the, the, the scope and size of our audience and our brand in India. And at some point, maybe we'll make something else happen with those. We haven't made that decision yet, but, but certainly that business is one because of what's happened in the media space in general, that we've tapered off our spend per some of the other questions that were asked previously. And we're looking at, I wouldn't call it idling, but we're looking at spending less to keep a growth rate up that slowed from what it might be if we were pumping more dollars into it. Question number three, gaming has so much potential, but also so much risk. How is Q Games Mela going to work given the 28% tax doesn't seem to be going anywhere? What are the future plans with this business unit? That's a question. The 28% tax that's being referred to is a tax that was levied about before we even launched Q Games Mela by the India government on what they call RMG or real money gaming or what most of us would call online gambling. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that that did have a profound effect on the market. We were fortunate enough to have not launched our product before that. And as many of you are aware, we took off like a rocket. And part of that was because we were also spending a lot of money. Any gaming business, it doesn't matter what it is, requires a significant capital spend to create the base of users that you need to reach profitability. And we were no different. What we've done is we've spoken about publicly before is we've taken the opportunity and tried to turn a challenged cash situation into an opportunity for us to dig in and make the product better and not to spend as much money on customer acquisition, retention, and engagement currently. So what we're doing as well, and it's not dissimilar to the answer that I just gave about the broadcast business, is we're looking at that business as one where we're not just going to keep pumping money in that frankly we don't have or to have to raise dilutive capital to drive that at the moment. We're strengthening the balance sheet with the success of some of the other parts of the business and by tapering off on our spend. And as we reach cash flow positive results overall, we can then begin to reinstate spend and begin to put more money into that to grow that. In the meantime, there's a lot of that's happening in the gaming space in terms of governmental regulation in India. We're sort of uh, monitoring that as well. There's a lot of rumors. We'll see if they come true or not that the Indian government is going to change that 28% tax. That obviously changes the dynamics of the financial rewards of that business. If we see that happening, then obviously that'll be a signal that we'll want to turn the jets on higher, but that's kind of where we're at with that business at the moment. Question number four, will social commerce be integrated into any offerings soon? Well, social commerce is something that also we've kept our eye on for a long time. And, and, and obviously anybody who uses Instagram or TikTok or any of these platforms is well aware that they've become platforms for selling products. I mean, I'm sure anybody who uses TikTok is familiar now with TikTok Shop. We've taken a strong look at that. We're engaged in that in conversations with a number of the brands and partners that we do work with. The truth is, is that in all of that area of social commerce, it's figuring out a revenue and, and bottom line uh, model where the, the juice is worth the squeeze and you can make enough money out of it to have the effort be a positive, cash flow uh, effort as opposed to something, again, that's burning cash. I mean, if you hear any theme right now in this whole first Thursday of October, it's that we are not looking to burn cash right now. We're looking to grow the business in a more conservative fashion, but only in ways that are going to produce positive financial results. And so as we do that, social commerce goes onto that list as well of something that we're looking at, that we're very interested in, that we expect we could do more with going forward and turn into a very, very positive positive cash generator and EBITDA positive business for us, but we're doing it in a conservative fashion until we strengthen the, the, the balance sheet more than what it is today. Question number five, can we expect any new major product services to be launched in 2025 or just some growth in the tuning of the existing offerings? Look, we're always developing new products inside the business. Probably the most specific area that we're doing a lot of work right now is on the influencer marketing part of our business. 
business with some AI driven tools and products that we use on a daily basis internally. Whether we ultimately choose to productize those for third parties or not in 2025 is a topic of discussion and remains to be seen. But you should always assume that we are building our own proprietary tools that increase our ability to increase our profit, increase our efficiency, uh, leverage the, the power of what AI delivers now. And uh, so there are things of that nature. In addition to that, you know, we've built our company to date through some M&A transactions along the way. Uh, Chatterbox was an M&A transaction. Maxim Tech was an M&A transaction. We hope that as we strengthen the financial underpinnings of the business going forward in 2025, maybe we'll all get lucky and the markets will continue to rebound, not just in the trillion dollar company assets, but also back down in the small and micro cap area. If those things happen, uh, we do believe strongly that there are ways through really smart acquisitions that you can build a company faster and, 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 and better. And so we're always keeping our eye open for those types of accretive uh, M&A transactions and we'll continue to do that in 2025. Question number six. It's a compilation of other questions that multiple people have asked that we group together because they're all relevant to the future of the Q business. Revenue growth from the India business units, it appears excluding Chatterbox, has not recently seen the type of progress that we all had hoped for. Are there strategies that we can expect to see implemented in the oncoming quarters to increase the revenue here without major increases to spending, or is it too unfavorable of a return right now and for the foreseeable few quarters to justify increased spending again in some of these business units? Well, that seems to be a theme for a lot of questions from the investors, and I think I've probably addressed that for the most part up to this point. The, th the thing that I would say is this, we recognize and understand that raising capital in the public markets at our current share price value is not something that any of us are desirous of for all the reasons that we've already spoken about. With that said, we also recognize and realize that we're a relatively small company, that there's tremendous growth potential in what we're doing, and that in a perfect world, we'd be sitting on $100 million and we would be making smart use of that money with everything from share buybacks to accretive M&A transactions. That just simply isn't what's possible right now. Do we think and hope that that day will come someday in the future? Absolutely, positively. Otherwise, we would fold up shop and say, sorry, everybody, this didn't work. It's not why we're doing this. So the concept of how we spend our capital, how we're uh, retooling our overall strategy with the business, how we are going to build into something that's much stronger than what we've been able to operate with over the last couple of years, that's a, that's a point of daily uh, focus uh, from our attention, from myself, from Raj, from Glenn, from Jace, from all the management team, board, etc. So the bottom line is, is that we are making moves, as I've said kind of over and over again, in Q4 of 2024, which we believe will pay off in a big beneficial way in 2025 and beyond. Those are things that we expect that you'll be hearing more about in the coming months, and certainly between now and the end of the year. And as those unveil themselves, I think it'll become more clear and obvious about what our our game plan is to increase shareholder value, increase share price, and make this a much happier situation for us all. Question number seven. Most Q videos on YouTube have generated less than 2,000 views total. Live streams average 1K views. Many vids are only to the hundreds of views. A rare few are the 10K plus views range, and these are videos hosted by other creators to promote interview the Q. I suspect the overall poor viewership reflects the general investor's lack of awareness of and interest in the Q as a brand. Can you comment on the initiatives to date that have been undertaken to promote Q to retail investors, including promoting current future YouTube videos? Can you further comment on upcoming initiatives to promote Q brand awareness among retail investors? If there are not any specific pending initiatives targeting retail investors' awareness engagement, please explain why. What investors wouldn't be aware of is that I speak to investors all the time. Uh, there's not a week that goes by that I'm not having conversations with either individual investors or financial institutions representing investors, whether that's individual brokers or you name it. So that goes on on a daily basis. What uh, has happened over the years for our business is 
We've tried a lot of different strategies in the IR space. The reason we've backed off on that a bit is that frankly, we were spending money and again, using capital there that wasn't really paying off for us. We weren't seeing with increased engagement. We, were, we had a couple of different situations where we were doing more frequent uh, live stream Q and A's and other things. And we just were not seeing the buying coming out of those sessions. With that said, we absolutely positively view IR as an extremely important part of our business. Obviously, shareholder awareness is key, and that's why we're doing this video right now. And so the, the fact of the matter is, is that we have a lot of, I'll call them low level areas that we're working in the IR space right now as we speak. When you begin to hear more about some of the changes and pivots and moves that we're making as we go into 2025, you'll see us begin to turn the juice up on that a bit more. Hopefully that will coincide with investor, core investor interest, but more than that, hopefully that will also coincide with the markets in the small and micro cap area improving. I mean, I don't think any of you who are investors in the small and micro cap area, of course, there's always going to be the odd big win here and there. But if you look at the overall space and you study it the way we do, you'll find without question that the market has been depressed for quite a long time now, a hell of a lot longer than any of us expected or wanted it to. And so what we don't want to do is we don't want to spend money and go sort of sailing into a hurricane. And so we continue to push IR activity in the company. We expect to push it harder as we go forward. But we think if we can push it harder when we have a stronger financial story to tell and a more specific story to tell going into 2025 for new investors in particular, that's going to help all of us that have been part of the Q story up till this point. And lastly, question number eight from one of our longtime supporters. Can we please get an update to the flow chart showing the new focus on key areas of growth in Q4 and 2025? The last time this was presented was two years ago. Lots has changed since then. Please advise on how you see it now. It's interesting, you know, when you talk about that chart being two years ago, I honestly think at that time, two things were true. First one is none of us expected market conditions to be what they are. And, and, the, and the second one is we never expected our share price to be at the levels that it's at today. I mean, it's, it's kind of almost unbelievable. And that chart was based on a much more robust capital situation for us to be able to be more aggressive and be on a grow, grow, grow path as opposed to a EBITDA, EBITDA path. I would argue that that probably changed almost two years ago when we were starting to design that and do that. And, you know, part of being an entrepreneur is being an eternal optimist. And I think all of us were eternal optimists that the market couldn't possibly last as long as it's lasted in this situation. And certainly none of us expected us to be at a share price situation, as I mentioned over and over on this video. So the bottom line is, is that what what we're doing is we're looking at simplifying. We're looking at simplifying. And if that chart was something that was kind of like this big picture that we looked at, now we're looking at going in and saying, okay, let's get into something that's more straight line oriented where we can see the demands of the business units to be constantly receiving investment capital is reduced and where the return and the EBITDA that comes from those parts of the business continues to grow. And so if you use that as kind of a kind of a guide guideline, if you will, in terms of what we're doing as a company, I think you, you would you would hear me say over and over again, let's simplify what we're doing. Let's reduce the complexities of what we're doing and let's increase the financial returns of the business units that we're focusing our efforts on. And so that's really what's been happening over the course, certainly of the last year. It takes time to change these things. There are a lot of different areas that you need to, to work on. We're doing that in real time. Time. And again, I think you'll see in 2025, maybe I'll break out a new map and it'll be uh, known to shareholders and a simpler one that people hopefully will get very, very excited about as we are. Because at the end of the day, there's not a person inside this company who knows what we're working on and doing for 2025 and beyond. And everybody's equally excited about the prospects and the potential of it. And that's why we still work 24 seven to make it happen. 
And so with that, that's the close of first Thursday of October. I'm going to be looking forward to hopefully delivering some really exciting news for all of you in the first Thursday of November. Know that that's what we're going to be working on like crazy in the next 30 days. In addition, you know, I just want to give a personal thank you to all of you that have been longtime supporters of the company. We know it's been a grind. We know it's been disappointing. Just please understand that none of us are happy with the share price or valuation of our business. And we're doing everything humanly possible around the clock to change that. And and we're going to change that. So with that, please look at the uh, description below if you want to go onto our Discord, ask questions there, follow us, see our other videos on our YouTube channel, and I'll look forward to seeing all of you uh, the first Thursday of November, hopefully to deliver you some more exciting news.